Knowing your vitamin D level is surprisingly common to see people come in with cognitive decline and their vitamin D level is 19 or 20. And we're saying, wait, what, what are you doing here? Well, they're, what they're doing is they're living indoors. They're not getting out enough. They're not taking vitamin D or they're not absorbing the vitamin D they're taking. So they're just not thinking about this. Dale, welcome. Thanks so much, Jason. Great to be here. So we were just chatting before we got started. I asked you if you were still at UCLA and because we were talking about the exciting time we live in and how more and more people are embracing lifestyle as a powerful tool to prevent whatever it is you're looking to prevent, whether, whether it's cardiovascular disease or in this case, Alzheimer's. And we said, it's so exciting. And then you said, well, it's really not to some, <laughs> in terms of medical school. So what, let's just start there quickly. Well, you know, it is it is exciting in terms of the new testing available and the new therapeutics available and the larger arsenal available. But it's also very frustrating. And as we were talking about before, medical schools are not embracing the new medicine. And you know, one of the vice chancellors of one of the major medical schools in the country told me several years ago, we'd like to teach this new kind of medicine, but we can't do that until all doctors accept it. Well, of course, all doctors won't accept it until you teach it. So here we have a very backward, you know, kind of very typical medical approach stuck in the previous century. And here we've got people who are dying needlessly with cognitive decline, left and right. And of course, the area of neurodegenerative disease has been the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. If someone tells you today, you've got Alzheimer's, or you've got Lou Gehrig's, or you've got Lewy body, or you've got frontotemporal dementia, you're going to die because they don't have anything to offer you. And at the same time, we just published a trial in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, freely available online. And you can see 84% of the people in the trial actually improved, didn't just slow their decline, they actually improved their scores. We have people now on observational trials that are now uh, 10 years in and still uh, doing very, very well. So long-term improvements. So you know, this is a strange time because we've got two different medicines. We have kind of standard of care medicine, and then we have integrative, precision, personalized, functional medicine. And these two, unfortunately, need to merge. They need to come together. We need to use the best of both, and we need to teach both. But only one of these, standard of care, is being taught in medical school. Wow. And just to frame this up for people, you know, in terms of your work in Alzheimer's, today, Alzheimer's disease is the fifth most common cause of death for Americans 65 and older, and almost two-thirds suffering from Alzheimer's are women. And it gets worse because Alzheimer's is projected to double by 2060. And, you know, as we all know, lots of pharmaceutical companies working on a vaccine. Uh, and what's so exciting about your work is you have a protocol that isn't going to require a jab or a pharmaceutical drug. And look, th those things save lives, but I think most people would agree, I would prefer not to do that. If that were even an option, because right now they're working on it, but to your point earlier, there is no solution. So let, let's start there at the highest level. Let's talk about your protocol and what you've seen if you could summarize that for folks. Yeah, great point. And you know, you mentioned the, the, the key point here, which is that uh, there's so many people dying of Alzheimer's. So we've had over a million people die in the US in the pandemic. Alzheimer's will kill almost 50 times that many of the currently living Americans. About 15% of the population dies from Alzheimer's. It's horrible. And it, as you mentioned, it's getting worse. So if you look at what we did, we spent 30 years in the lab looking at what is the fundamental nature of the neurodegenerative process? Why do you have this brain degenerative process? And people have gone after all sorts of things. You know, one, one group says it's herpes of the brain. Another group says it's prions, it's amyloid, it's tau, it's, uh, you know, it, it's epigenetic problem. It's on and on and on. None of these approaches has ever led to a successful therapeutic. And so what we realized after years in the lab is that this is fundamentally a network insufficiency. And what I mean by that is you have a whole network of things that will signal to the brain whether you're going to grow, make new synapses and maintain those synapses 
things are good. You know, your inflammation is low, your toxicity is low, you've got good energetics, good trophic activity. You signal to your brain, okay, time to, to build. On the other hand, when things are bad, you go into a, a protective downsizing mode just like what happened with COVID-19. We were all told to shelter in place and socially distance, don't go to work. We went into a recession. That's just what your brain does with Alzheimer's. You have insults. And the problem has been there are dozens of insults that do this. So when we treat the disease, the idea here is your supply to this network, your neuroplasticity network, is chronically outstripped by your demand. So we measure all those things, insulin resistance, your gut leak, your ongoing inflammation, your methylation, on and on and on. And then we're going to target those things that are suboptimal. We're dropping the demand, we're increasing the supply. So we're dropping the demand by improving the inflammatory status and in improving the toxicity status. And we're increasing the supply by improving things like SpO2, cerebral blood flow, mitochondrial function, trophic support, things like that, all of those things. And what's amazing is people get better. And in a trial that we published, even their MRIs got better. So it was striking. Not only did their cognitive scores get better, but their MRIs showed it. So b before we dive into some of the, the markers and tests that one should do, I'm going to start with you know DNA and genetics. And the, the, the APOE4 gene, I think a lot of people know, can put you at risk, which approximately 25% of the population has this gene. And so how do you think about that gene specifically as a, as a risk factor and other risk factors, for example, lifestyle factors like nutrition, exercise, sleep, environment? C could you walk us through your thinking, how you view genetics and lifestyle and our ability to turn off or turn on this gene. Yeah, that's a great point. So what we do is we think of these various players, the various signaling, the various uh, insults that happen, because really this is disease is a response to insults. And unfortunately, insults that begin at birth, that's the surprise. Things like how our airway is formed, um, whether we get addicted to sugar from formula, things like that, unfortunately. So they're starting very early. And we're looking at these, and then as you mentioned, you look at these are all playing on a genetic background. So just as you indicated, there are people who are highly susceptible, intermediately susceptible, and low susceptibility to all, developing Alzheimer's disease. And these have to do with things like inflammation. Now there are dozens of genes, but as you mentioned, the most important and most common is APOE, the Epsilon-4 allele, also referred to as APOE4. So for, as you said, for three quarters of us, we're APOE4 negative. Like I checked myself, I'm a 3-3, which is the most common. That means my lifetime risk is about 9% for Alzheimer's. It's not zero, but it's not huge. If you have a single copy of APOE4, and that is 75 million Americans, your lifetime risk is 30%. Everybody should find out where they are. You can absolutely prevent this problem. Literally, Alzheimer's is becoming optional. There's a wonderful website, apoe4.info, started by an APOE44 homozygote who's done very, very well and is now 10 years on the approach that we developed um, and continuing to do very well and actually wrote part of the second book with me. Uh, so 30% for the heterozygotes. The homozygotes, there are, so two copies of APOE4, they uh, are 7 million Americans. And of course, the vast majority don't know it until they start to develop Alzheimer's. And their risk is well over 50%, in some studies up to 90%. So in all likelihood, they will develop Alzheimer's disease unless they get on active prevention. So we encourage everyone who's 45 or over please get a cognoscopy, just like we know we should get a colonoscopy when we turn 50. Please get a cognoscopy if you're 45 or over. Get on active prevention to make sure you don't develop Alzheimer's. So what is a cognoscopy? Where can one go get one? Yeah, so you can just go to mycognoscopy.com. It's easy to do, um, and it consists of three things. 
And I have to say, it's much more pleasant than a colonoscopy. So good thing to know about. So number one, you want to have some, some blood tests that will indicate, and unfortunately not being done by many physicians. We've now trained over 2,000 physicians in the protocol we developed in 10 countries and all around the U.S. So it's pretty easy to, to get in. Um, but you can actually do a cognoscopy without seeing a physician. So you can get uh, blood drawn, et cetera, and simply get a report. So you can actually see this, number one. So we're looking at what is your HOMA IR? What, do you have APOE4, just as you mentioned? Um, what's your methylation status? Do you have toxicity? All the things that drive cognitive decline. Number two, a simple online cognitive assessment. It takes 25 or 30 minutes so you can see where you are. Because as you can imagine, this sneaks up on many people. We had a woman who came in a few years ago, said, you know, it's in my family uh, and I want to make sure that I'm not getting, I think I'm okay. I think I'm here for prevention. Well, she scored a 23 out of 30 on the MOCA, which means she was already well into the third stage, which is called mild cognitive impairment. And that's another issue here. These stages of Alzheimer's, people wait way too late to intervene. And now after treatment, she's a perfect 30 and she's doing great. So it does sneak up on you and people say, oh, you're just getting a little older, that sort of thing. Then the third part of the cognoscopy is only necessary if you're having symptoms, and that is to get an MRI with volumetrics. So you see your hippocampal volume and you see your gray matter volume. But if you're there for just for prevention, just the first two, easy to do, and you can see where you stand and get an idea how to prevent the development of Alzheimer's. So in the book, you go into great detail. You list a number of markers, labs that one should get tested for if, if they're concerned. If you had to summarize, you know, what are what are maybe the top five that non-negotiables, if someone's concerned, they should go to their doctor and say, hey, I, I, I want these five labs immediately. Yes. So we have a, something called pre-code, which is prevention of cognitive decline, and which gets a smaller number of labs. So you can do that. And absolutely, what, so the, the simple way to think about this is to summarize it as four major groups. And then within those, you want to know something about each of those. So group number one is energetics. And so you want to know your mitochondrial function, your SpO2, are you dropping your oxygenation at night? So common and an important contributor to cognitive decline. And then your, your blood flow and then your ketone level. Um, so you want to get a general idea about energetics. And you can get that in part just by getting a lipid panel because that'll tell you, are your vessels in good shape or are your vessels in poor shape? And by getting an HSCRP. So second big issue is inflammation. And so just getting an HSCRP, simple thing to do. And if, you're at, you know, if your HSCRP is sitting at 0.3 or 0.4, you don't have a lot of systemic inflammation, as you know. But if it's sitting up at 3 or 5 or 10, which we see all the time, you've got ongoing inflammation. Even if it's sitting up at you know, 1.2, you've got too much ongoing systemic inflammation. Um, and then the third piece is toxicity. And toxicity is coming from three different types of toxins. It's coming from inorganics, things like air pollution. And this has been shown repeatedly over the last several years. Increase in air pollution increases risk for Alzheimer's and some uh, inorganic toxins like mercury. So yeah, you'd like to know your mercury level. That's another good one to know. Second group is the organics. And then the third group is the biotoxins. So it would be helpful to know a TGF beta 1 will tell you a lot about whether you are exposed to biotoxins or tick-borne illnesses, things like that, that also increase your risk. And then finally, trophic support. And so you need to support your brain and things like knowing if your homocysteine is okay, which is involved with, uh, with inflammation as well, uh, and, and detox, both of these. Knowing your vitamin D level is surprisingly common to see people come in with cognitive decline and their vitamin D level is 19 or 20. And we're saying, wait, what, what are you doing here? Well, they, what they're doing is they're living indoors. They're not getting out enough. They're not taking vitamin D or they're not absorbing the vitamin D they're taking. So they're just not thinking about this. And then, of course, omega-3s, another great thing. So I would advise people, please have either your omega-3 index, we'd like to see it at 10% or higher, or at least get your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And as you know, 
Average Americans, it's up in the 15, 20, even 25. I talked to someone the other day, checked that it was 23. They went on appropriate treatment. It's now three to one. And three to one is good. You want to be in the kind of one to one to three to one range. You don't want to be below 0.5 to one, but you want to be in that one to three or even four range, not up at 15 to one. So those are the the kind of general things that you want to look at, things like HSCRP, homocysteine, vitamin D, omega-3. Things like that are critical. I'm a huge believer in omega-3s. And just on a personal note, our listeners are probably sick of me saying this, but I am a I have a methylation story to share. So what's the highest homocysteine you've seen? That's a great point. So um, the highest homocysteine I've seen is 32. I have not seen 100. The ones up in the 100, you know, I've not seen those, but I've read about them. So this was about four or five years ago. Um, cardiovascular disease runs in my family. And, and Dr. Frank Lipman is, is, a, is a dear friend. And I, I started to, to see him in my, in my 40s because I said, you know what? I need to get a little bit more sophisticated here, on, you know, blood testing. So do all the do all the labs. I'm pretty good across the board with the exception of homocysteine. Comes back as 63. Wow. Yeah. Frank says it's a mistake. Take it again. I take it again. It's still high. And so he messengered me over a cocktail. Essentially, it's your cocktail. It was the B, B, B methylfolate, B vitamins, betaine, very similar to what you described in the book and actually led to us formulating a product around this. And I was like, he was, I was like, Frank, what, what do I, what do I, what do I do? You know, my diet is, is pretty good. And he was like, you know what? You, you need to, I had the D, the, the C677T seven, seven double gene. So like I, I'm MTHFR, which most significant part of the population has. I went from just with supplementation, 63 to now I'm between 12 and 15. I can't get it lower. I can't get it. Lower. And I'm just like, I'm at peace with it. I realize, look, everyone's got everything else is fine. And, and, you know, I'm still always looking for, you know, can I get it to seven or eight? But, you know, I, I've sort of come to the conclusion. If I don't, I'm, I'm pretty okay. Uh, but, but wow, I've got a methylation problem. Yeah. And it's a good point. And it's great that you found, this is the thing that, uh, that, you know, we physicians were taught to respond to symptoms and now, of course, virtually all of us are dying of complex chronic illnesses where the symptoms don't come until late in the process. So therefore, it's really changed the way we think about these things. Just what you did is the right thing. You go in and you find out, what am I, instead of saying, what do I have? You say, what am I headed for? And you want to look at all these different pieces. And we need a lot more Silicon Valley in our medicine. We need to have larger data sets. We need to have more computer-based algorithms. It's so interesting to me that, you know, Google knows where you shop. They know what you're doing every day. Why aren't we using these same sorts of approaches to understand who's headed, for, not just for what shopping center, but who's headed for what disease? And this needs to be done much more in medicine. 100% agreed. And with regards to cognitive decline, and the same with, with methylation, homocysteine, there's no symptom. I had no symptoms. People always ask, how did you feel? I felt fine. I felt great. I didn't feel anything. And with cognitive decline, your earlier point, when you start to notice problems with recall, memory issues, it's often too late. Exactly. And you know that, that you know you bring up a really important point, which is that when you develop Alzheimer's, it's the end stage of something that takes at least 20 years. So the, the first stage of this illness, you're, you're asymptomatic, just what you were saying about having a high homocysteine. You have no symptoms, and yet you can already begin to pick it up, often in your 30s, on PET scan changes and on spinal fluid changes. But of course, most of us are not having routine spinal taps for obvious reasons, and we're not going in for routine PET scans. So then you go into stage two, which is called subjective cognitive impairment. And it's so interesting for me. So many physicians say, oh, that's just normal aging. Everyone has trouble with their brain with aging. No, they don't. In fact, we all know some people who are in their 80s, 90s, or even 100 who are sharp as a tack. So in fact, this is 
SCI, subjective cognitive impairment, by definition, you know there's a problem, you know that something's wrong, and yet you're still able to score normally on standard neurocognitive testing. Now, interestingly, that phase lasts on average, according to the epidemiologists, 10 years. So we have a tremendous window of opportunity to prevent dementia. The third stage is called, unfortunately, mild cognitive impairment, MCI. This is like telling someone, don't worry, you only have mildly metastatic cancer. It is a late stage of a terminal illness. And yet, we still turn these people around all the time. And in the trial we just published, 84% of them got better. And then fourth and final stage is when you actually have dementia. And by definition, what that means is you've now begun to lose your activities of daily living. You may have trouble balancing your checkbook. You may have trouble uh, showering, taking care of yourself, whatever it is. That is the end stage. And unfortunately, it's when most people are going in to see a physician about the problem. So if we can just convince people to come in for active prevention or during that 10 years of SCI, there would be very, very little Alzheimer's disease. So let, let's segue to prevention because Alzheimer's and all forms of cognitive decline are horrifying. And I, I do think it's very encouraging that we have an audience that's younger and interested in taking proactive steps. You know, the great work of Maria Shriver, her son Patrick, you know, you get it, getting this on the radar. Patrick Schwarzenegger's, you know, young Hollywood star, he's talking about cognitive decline. So I think there's a lot of energy around it, which is very positive. And so with that said, I, I want to walk through prevention in terms of lifestyle. And I always like to start with the big one, nutrition. And so how would you describe your nutritional philosophy for those looking to take those preventative steps today? Yeah, great point. And as you indicated, nutrition really comes first. There are seven basics, nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress reduction or stress management, brain training, targeted uh, supplements and detox. Those are the seven. And as you said, nutrition comes first. It's amazing how much that contributes, something I was never taught as a neurologist being trained, how important nutrition is in cognitive decline. And so we use something called KetoFlex 12.3. And the idea is if you look at all the studies published, if you look at all the biochemistry, and we're really coming from what does it take to make and keep synapses. That's what we want and that's what Alzheimer's takes away. What does it take biochemically to do that? It turns out that the best from the nutrition side is a plant rich, so high phytonutrients, high fiber, multicolored, et cetera, uh, all these wonderful phytonutrients coming from the plant. So plant rich, mildly ketogenic, we're talking 1.0 to 4.0 millimolar, beta hydroxybutyrate, or if you prefer acetone, 10 to 40 ACEs um, on a breathalyzer, for example, um, then th that's the range you want. So, so a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet with appropriate fasting periods. Now you have to be careful if you're frail to begin with, you don't wanna have long fasting periods. So that's the paradox on the nutrition for Alzheimer's. On the one hand, you need to be insulin sensitive and you help that by, be, by doing some fasting. On the other hand, you need to be able to get into ketosis, which often is helped by doing some fasting. So what, we, what that means is you don't wanna hurt yourself because this is a network insufficiency. If you just go to a long fasting period, you can get worse. So what we suggest is start out with some exogenous ketones. Dr. Stephen Kinane from Canada, beautiful studies showing that just exogenous ketones actually improve MCI. So start with those and then ease into, you know, get your weight appropriate, get your BMI appropriate, and then ease into endogenous ketosis over a couple of months. Because again, you wanna become metabolically flexible, that's the goal. You wanna have the ability to use glucose and the ability to use to use ketones. And you know, insulin is a, an important trophic factor. When we used to grow brain cells in, in a dish all the time in the lab, of course, we always had to include insulin, transferrin, and selenium. These are critical factors for these neurons to survive. So when you develop insulin resistance, and by the way, the amyloid itself binds to the insulin receptor and inhibits its signaling. 
So another problem there, in addition to our endogenous insulin resistance, then in fact, you want to get rid of that insulin resistance, become insulin sensitive again, and you want to be able to go back and forth. And unfortunately, most people with cognitive decline have neither. They're neither insulin sensitive, nor are they keto adapted. So in terms of fasting window, what does that look like? Is that 14 to 18 hours? Just how do you quantify that for people? Yeah, great point. So we want enough time to un, to induce autophagy. We want enough time for brain cleaning uh, and, and the you know the the whole glymphatic system, which is by the way inhibited by noradrenergic activity. So if you're if you've got sleep apnea and you're or you got upper airway resistance and you're being activated all night, you're not cleaning your brain the way you should. So you takes typically twelve to fourteen hours if you're APOE four negative. 14 to 16 hours if you're APOE4 positive, because APOE4 positive, you tend to do better with absorbing fat. If you starve a bunch of people, the APOE4 positives live and the ones who are APOE4 ne negative die. So um, that, that's, you know, that is a, a key difference. And in fact, you know, APOE4, again, it's not that it's worse. It's just different. It is, it has been argued, it's the thing that allowed us to become hominids. The simians don't have it. And it's the thing that allowed us, it is a pro-inflammatory gene. It is a gene that allows us to eat and live longer on one meal. So it's the thing that allowed us, as Professor Tuck Finch from USC suggested years ago, allowed us to come down out of the trees, walk on the savanna, puncture our feet, eat food that is raw, filled with microbes, and we were resistant to all these things. And still, if you live in a third world country, you do better better cognitively, better with respect to longevity if you are APOE4 positive. Interesting. And so you mentioned a, a plant-based keto diet. What does that look like? You know, what, should, what should be on our plant-based keto grocery list? Yeah, that's such a good point because people automatically think, oh, keto, give me some bacon, give me some ham, stuff like that. And that turns out not to be uh, helpful for cognitive decline, as you know. Uh, so the, what this means is you want to have, as, the, as has been said by so many people, you know, Mark Hyman, David Perlmutter, on and on and on, have the biggest part of your plate is a salad. And you want to look, and, and, and then, of course, you want to include lots of extra virgin olive oil. And again, I realize, you know, it, you know olive oil is in some way, sense a processed food, but this is giving you wonderful omega-3s. And then you want to have with it some uh, protein. So you want to have a high good fats, intermediate protein, low carbs, and hopefully zero simple carbs, and especially fructose, which is a big player in cognitive decline. So yeah, get yourself a big salad, have some wild caught fish, um, preferably some smash fish. So you want the low mercury fish, the wild caught fish, things like salmon, mac uh, mackerel, not king mackerel, uh, anchovies, sardines, and herring um, as being the smash fish, the ones that are going to give you the good omega-3s without giving you the mercury that you don't need. Or have some uh, pastured eggs and pastured chicken or or some uh, grass-fed beef, any of those things, great. Keep that good omega-3 and check your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Uh, then you wanna keep low on, you wanna stay away from grains, you wanna stay away from inflammatory dairy, uh, you know, th those sorts of things that are gonna be giving you a problem and things that are going to potentially damage uh, your, uh, your intestinal lining. So you don't want to have a leaky gut. And it's, as you know, it's incredibly common to have a leaky gut. We want to optimize our microbiome. There, as you know, there's a lot that's not known about what to do to get the best organisms into your microbiome. People are saying, oh, you got to have acromancia and mucinophila because that's the key. You don't want to have this. Or, well, okay, we don't know everything yet, but we do know that diversity is critical for the microbiome. And so in terms of diversity, how do you think about, uh, you know, you mentioned dairy as a no. So do you mean excluding dairy altogether? Or if you've got a problem with dairy, avoid it? Or do you avoid uh, dairy with casein or not just in general? Is it, is it dairy as a whole? Is there some dairy okay for some people or for others if you know, they've got a bloating issue. Just, I just want to be clear on dairy specifically. You know, you brought up what is a really important concept that, again, most physicians don't utilize. And that is 
that this is, an, this is a dynamic process. So it's ongoing. So when someone comes in to see us with cognitive decline and any of the physicians who worked with me on the trial, wonderful f- functional medicine, medicine physicians, Dr. Ann Hathaway, Dr. Kat Toops, Dr. Deborah Gordon, they will start with no dairy. But as you indicated, See how it goes. So this, again, this is a dynamic process. You have to remember when people come to see us with cognitive decline, one of two things will happen. We'll make them better or they will die. So we pull out all the stops at the beginning. This is a terminal illness. And if you go to any of the standard memory uh, centers around the country, they'll just tell you you're going to die. And uh, we're going to give you some drug that doesn't work very well. And you're going to die anyway. It's a horrible, horrible situation. So we wanna do everything possible to change that ratio so that we've got a good synaptoblastic side and a low synaptoclastic side. Now, what you can then do as you get better, sure, reintroduce a little bit of dairy, but check to make sure it's not giving you problems. As you indicated, some people get bloating. For some people, it is truly pro-inflammatory. There are people who are lactose intolerant, have a problem, of course. There are people where um, this, especially along with gluten-containing foods, um, will give you a leaky gut. So you, the good news is we can now look at these systems very nicely, and you can tell. And there's a, a huge future for wearables. Now, wearables don't tell you about gut leak, but they tell you about so many other issues from heart rate variability. We can now, as biohackers, check our telomere length and our microbiomes and our, and our leaky gut and our heart rate variability and our sleep status and you know, whether we're getting enough slow wave sleep, whether we're getting enough uh, REM sleep, what our oxygenation status is while we're sleeping, all these critical things so that we can actually help ourselves to live you know, healthy to 100 without getting any cognitive decline. And that, again, that should be the goal for everyone. Let's get to 100 with no cognitive decline. So you know, again, we start without the dairy, but you can try some. Yeah, I would try A2 if you're going to now reintroduce it uh, so that you don't have you know, the, the casein issue that you alluded to. Food, obviously, a powerhouse. And in my opinion, and I'm not alone here, next to food is exercise. So in terms of exercise, specifically for prevention, how do you think about types of exercise, frequency, and duration? If you were to prescribe to someone, this is what you need to do. If you're concerned, you're young, you're fine. Maybe it runs in your family, maybe it doesn't. But if you're concerned, this is how you should think about exercise. Yeah, great point. And, you know, for all of these things, we're getting a much better understanding. We're linking the molecular biology of the APP signaling and of the synaptic signaling in your brain to the actual intervention. And so one of the interesting papers from several years ago was showing that when you exercise, your ketone levels go up. And interestingly, the ketones find their way into your brain and they actually interact with specific histones to reduce the inhibition of producing brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And we've always known that somehow exercise increases BDNF. We just didn't know how it did it. Now we're understanding how these things link up and we're having better and better tools. So I really like two things that have come up recently. One is called Katsu. These are these restriction bands that you put on. Improves flow, it improves, it gives you more bang for your buck in terms of strength training. These were used by some of the Olympic athletes and has been used by very elderly people with very good results because you don't have to exercise as long. Katsu, how do you, how do you spell that? I haven't heard of that. Yeah, K-A-A-T-S-U, check it out, Katsu bands. You put them on your arms and legs, and then you get basically more bang for your buck. Um, and then the second thing is, uh, is EWOT, exercise with oxygen therapy. There is more and more work showing that as we begin to get a little older, we're not perfusing the brain. We're not getting quite enough oxygen. And so, again, it's another signal to the brain, start downsizing, living with a smaller brain. Well, no, as you were just saying, we're, how do we tell young people we can pretty much guarantee that you can get to 100 without cognitive decline. Well, it does start with this, you know, the things we're talking about right now. And so I would recommend to anybody, please get both strength training. Strength training really helps your insulin resistance and aerobics, which really helps 
the ketone side, the blood flow side, the oxygenation side. So these are very much synergistic in the way they work. And I would recommend get 45 minutes of good exercise at least five times a week. Make sure you really get out there. And, and I unfortunately, I run into people who say, well, I do walk. Well, okay, but you want to get your heart rate up. Um, you know, you want to you want to get that rate up and keep it up for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and, you know, whether you like to do, you know, 70 percent of your maximum heart rate, whatever you're you're looking for in there. Now, obviously, you don't want to give yourself a, a myocardial infarction. So don't jump on this. You know, by, I always say biological systems were not meant to function in square waves. You don't go from zero running to a marathon the next day. So work up to it and you'll do much, much better. Well, I think that's an important note because everyone can walk. But if you think about the 60 to 70 percent, you can get there walking if you're walking at a fast pace or taking the stairs. I wear an aura and a whip and I track everything and I can get there very easily if I just walk really fast. It's not that difficult. Essentially, to summarize, it's, it's walking fast where you could hold a conversation, but maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable. You're slightly out of breath. Yes. Remember that change requires some stress. That's what hormesis is all about. So you want to do a little more than you did before so that you're now slightly improving each day. If you're just walking and you're getting your heart rate to 90, probably not going to do nearly as much for you as if, as you said, you're walking and you're walking fast or you're walking uphill or you're doing you know, stairs up and down, whatever it is. Get that heart rate going, and it will pay dividends in the long run. You know, you mentioned hormesis, and my version of that, you know, we recently moved to Miami, and so I'll go for a very quick walk in the middle of the day when it is extraordinarily hot and humid. That's <laughs> uh, on that note, I do want to spend time on hormesis. You know, how do you think about hot? cold therapy, everything from cold showers to plunges to hot baths and saunas. These are wonderful. And of course, I really do like the sauna. You know, you, you can add sauna with a plunge. Great. Uh, but sauna I like because it is so good with detox. And there was, a, of course, very famous study out of Finland a few years ago showing that as people increase their saunas per week from one or two to six, they decreased their rate, uh, their risk for developing dementia. And it was a quite striking effect, actually. So again, detox, something that is a, when I was being trained as a neurologist, we were never taught that these various toxin exposures were actually critical for cognitive decline. It was just people get Alzheimer's. We don't know why it is. Uh, we don't have a good treatment for it and people are going to die. So now that we understand that, in fact, toxins are one of the critical things that contributes to risk for cognitive decline, saunas are coming up as very important. And again, same thing with exercise, sweating, using some, uh, you know, some detoxing soap like a Castile soap to get rid of, of these toxins, very helpful. And all the ways to get rid of them, very, very helpful. So yes, I think hormesis, you're absolutely right. So more specifically to me though, and for those who live in uh, warm climates, is it as effective to go for a very brisk walk or run when it's like 105, 110 degrees? Does that have the same effect as a sauna or, or somewhat similar? Well, that's a great point. So if you can, you know, first of all, working up a sweat um, and, you know, and second of all, again, you know, getting that, getting that heart rate up. So absolutely. That's if you're going to get a good sweat, that's fine. Now you're right. You, you, do you get the same sort of infrared effect? Um, given the fact that, you know, the sun has an entire spectrum and that includes infrared, uh, especially late in the day, um, then you probably will get, uh, you know, as, as has been pointed out, anything that gets you sweating and then removing that sweat can be very helpful as a part of your detox regimen. So let's talk about the sun for a moment. You know, to some degree, the sun's gotten a bad rap. You know, we... we, we <laughs> You know, look, I don't think the message is go out there in the middle of the day and, and throw on the, the tanning lotion and just bask in the sun for hours and, and, and you know, become a leather-like human, at, you know, <laughs> with leather-like skin. I don't think that's the message that the, the sun can do damage. But I do want to take a step back and think about the sun in terms of the morning and the evening when, when, when the UV rays are, are less powerful. So how do you think about the relationship 
between our health and the sun, specifically in the morning and evening. It's a good point. And what's been pointed out uh, by others, and I think it's a, it's a very nice point, the morning sun is telling your body, you're getting more of that UV and it's telling your body it's daytime, your circadians are reset, um, and it's a good idea. And in fact, by the way, if you're traveling uh, you know, west to east or east to west, you want to get out and get that sunlight at a time when it is dark for your where you came from. So if you're going east, you want to get out early in the day to get that to tell you reset my circadians, please. If you're going west, you want to go late in the day again to say reset my circadians, please. Then, as you indicated, late in the day, it's a different sun as you're setting. You're really getting more of the infrared that's telling you, okay, late in the day, please start winding down. So your circadians, no question, are helped. And you know, I say one of the big themes that we realize going through all this molecular signaling is that we we really spend way too much time indoors. We are living, you know, all of us, we are living in what is often mold food, what is a relatively toxic environment, what is often a relatively high uh, carbon dioxide environment and a relatively low oxygenated environment. Uh, there are just so many things about being outdoors that actually helpful. Now, I get it. If you're living on a freeway and outdoors is full of air pollution, you got to be careful. But especially, hey, as I said, I grew up in Lauderdale. You've got the, the trade winds there all the time. It's a beautiful place. The air is clean. The beach is a great place for exercise. So you can be, you know, it's a tremendous place to be healthy. I, I agree. I couldn't, I, I love, love, love Miami. Um, so, you know, as I think about our conversation, a lot of what we've discussed so far is, is obvious, you know, eat a lot of plants, have, a, you know, make sure you're getting omega threes, avoid the sixes. You want to get that ratio right. You got to move. You got to get your heart rate up. Hormesis is good. What are some of the less obvious things we should be aware of in terms of things we should avoid that we're probably not thinking of or things we should be doing that aren't as obvious as, you know, eating lots of uh, polyphenol rich vegetables? Yeah, great point. So the things we've talked about are the basics. And then, unfortunately, the things that you don't know about often that will get you, number one, people who have chronic undiagnosed infections. And so we see it all the time. People come in with cognitive decline and they have undiagnosed babesia or they have recurrent herpes simplex, which is actually, which gets into the brain. So unfortunately, the, the neuropathologists have shown us when you look at the amyloid plaques in the brain, what are they doing? It is your brain's innate immune system covering pathogens and toxins with this preventive stuff. So you're literally protecting your brain. Now, unfortunately, it's also downsizing the brain. So it's literally saying, okay, we can't live the way we are. We got an ongoing insult. We've got to divert our resources to dealing with these toxins and with these uh, pathogens. So changes in oral microbiome. So I recommend everyone check out your oral microbiome. You can do that very easily with oral DNA. And I have no relationship with the company, companies that make oral DNA, like you know my perioath. Uh, this is good to know. Do you have high P. gingivalis, T. denticola, Prevotella intermedia, F. nucleatum. These, as you know, these organisms are being found in the brain. They're being found in the plaques of coronary arteries. They're being found in cancers. So these things are uh, impacting us systemically. Babesia, another one, tick-borne illnesses. When people get Borrelia, the Lyme organism, in more than 50% of cases, they also get co-infections, Babesia, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, things like that. So important to find out if you have those. Check out your gut microbiome. So those are the kind of the additions. Those are the specific things that you need to know for each person and the things that will drive, even though you might be having enough polyphenols, et cetera, which, you know, again, which are helpful to you. But if you're not getting over the hump, you may have a chronic infection comes up all the time. And then toxins, you need to check all three. Inorganics, what's your mercury status? Do you have a lot of exposure to, uh, to air pollution? What are, your, what are the rest of your metals? Uh, 
organics, things like uh, glyphosate, toluene, formaldehyde, benzene, and then uh, mycotoxins and other biotoxins, things like trichothecenes. And this is, again, something we see all the time, trichothecene-related cognitive decline, gliotoxin, ochratoxin A, all of these mycotoxins. So those are the ones that are missed by classical medicine and go beyond just what you were saying, go beyond the typical, you know, eat good vegetables and, and have some periods of fasting. So that's where the people who are getting the best outcomes are doing the basics, but then looking in for the specifics as, and addressing those as well. And in terms of environment, we, we spoke about sun. How do you think about light, artificial light, being indoors, different types of lighting, windows, just light, light in general in an in indoor environment. Yeah, this is such a good point because, you know, as a simple rule, basically, you want to get as much outdoor light as you can while at the you know, period of the sun being up. And you want to minimize, especially the blue light, but you want to minimize the light in the evening. You know, when the sun goes down, we're now Tr you know, we're now tricking mother nature, which is never a good idea. And especially for those of us, and I'm guilty of this myself, working away at 2 a.m. on a computer, that's the wrong thing to be doing. It's actually hurting your sleep. It's hurting your circadians. Um, and, it, and it unfortunately is often associated with poor cardiovascular outcome as well. So to the extent possible, we want to wind things down. And I should mention, we have been doing a project now looking at macular degeneration. We're taking what we've done in Alzheimer's and adapting this for all of the other major neurodegenerative conditions, Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, ALS, macular degeneration, et cetera. And what we're seeing is that you know, exposure to light, no surprise, you've got that long-term blue light exposure, it exceeds what your macula was meant to handle. Your macula, as long as the light is on, is like a Ferrari going 260 miles an hour. You are really zipping through, the, these, these things are firing. Your, your photoreceptor cells are firing, 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 firing. So you've got to give them a rest. And this is why some people like the idea of a little bit of red light therapy, getting down, using the blue blockers, at least do that, at least minimize the blue because that's the high energy light that is damaging to these things. And they've got to be uh, literally what, what happens each day, they lose their heads um, because they've got, they've essentially taken out the garbage and picked up by your RPEs, your retinal pigment epithelium cells. And those are the ones that fail first in macular degeneration. By the way, twice as much macular degeneration in the U.S. as there is Alzheimer's. It's incredibly common. And there's no treatment for early onset for, or for the initial part, the so-called dry. And by the way, they've done really well on the program we developed, just the first couple patients. So we're very excited about that. So as you indicated, you don't want blue light, you know, great to have light in the home during the day, but when the sun goes down, you want to get as little blue light exposure and as, as much as possible, obey the circadians, your own circadians and the circadians of the earth. And so in closing, I want to bring it back to the title of the book, The End of Alzheimer's Program. And so when will we see the end of Alzheimer's? And in terms of what you're seeing, to some degree, we, we have a 0% success rate, pharmaceutically at least, with, with, with intervention. When can we get to a place where we're 50%, maybe 70%? Well, when, how, how do you see that curve in the future to leave people with some hope? With everything we know today from the research, Alzheimer's is now becoming optional. And so if everybody would get on active prevention or earliest reversals, don't wait if you've got a problem. If you've got SCI, get in there. Then we could see dramatically less. Now, it'll take some time for the current Alzheimer's patients to move through the system, but we will see much less. And I do believe there should be a global program, just as we had global programs for vaccination against smallpox, uh, for example, uh, and against polio. We need to have global programs to reduce the burden of dementia. And I believe we could reduce, we could certainly reduce the incidence. So the new case is coming by 50% within the next five years if people would just do the right things. The problem is everyone's still stuck in this idea of 
pharmaceuticals, monotherapies. The pharmaceuticals are going to work the best when they're on the backbone of a personalized precision medicine protocol. 100% agree. Dale, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jason. Great talking to you.